thank you all for uh, joining. Um, actually, it is wonderful to see a lot of familiar faces here. Uh, it's been a couple of years since we've all been able to breathe the same air. Uh, and it's nice to be doing that again. Good to see everyone. Nice to have caught up with a few people yesterday. I'm looking forward to drinks after all of this tonight as well, which is which is really cool. So I'm here to um, present uh, uh, some com or relay, I should say, some conversations I've had with um, firms in the industry to uh, try to present a review, a review of industry activity in and around FTC3 uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I'm speaking as a FINOS member. Adaptive, we have been members of FINOS for the last couple of years. Uh, Rico Eckstein, if you could put your hand up, Rico, everyone knows who you are, um, uh, is, was, a, was a chair, co-chair, and was formerly up on the program committee of FTC3. Uh, and so we are very invested in FTC3 itself uh, as a firm, and I'll, I'll touch on why as I go through. Um, so we are a, uh, very quickly, a tech provider that works in the front office space of the financial services industry. Um, we deliver change that our clients own. So we build platform solutions for our clients and they own the resulting IP, um, which is a little different to other tech vendors. Uh, makes us quite, look quite like a, uh, a standalone software consultancy, which is where we got our, got our start. Uh, but we use our own uh, or the industry's um, accelerators and platforms to reduce the lift in how much needs to be done, therefore how much needs to be spent, to deliver business value for our clients. Um, so the ecosystem that is associated with FTC3, um, Cosaic, Glue42, OpenFin, um, they are to us a platform that we build within front office trading applications for our clients. Um, and back in the long, long ago in 2012-13, um, when a few of us were at uh, Deutsche Bank, um, we implemented something uh, for, um, for Deutsche Bank that was very similar to what OpenFin went on to provide a few years later. It's an HTML5 runtime container that has created this wonderful ecosystem that we all live in today. Um, and those, are, those things, although we may not recognize them as such, are what I think of as the platforms in our industry that we use as a group to build on top things that actually matter to our users, that actually create business value. Um, it's not that exciting having a group of C++ engineers inside your organization, keeping up to date with Chromium, um, integrating bug fixes, integrating with all your internal technology. It's much better to have a, a firm build that um, create an ecosystem and then build on top the bits that you actually use to differentiate with your own market, with your own clients. Um, and so it's in that lens, through that lens, that we see FTC3 as uh, a platform, as an enabler to drive real business value for our clients. Um, Chris, later on this afternoon, is going to give a fantastic talk on what FTC3 is itself. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that from a technical perspective. Um, I want to talk about what it can do for users, um, not necessarily uh, users who even understand what the tech, sorry, and, and not users who understand what the technology is. Developers are users of FTC3, of course, but the primary audience are people that stitch together workflow experience, um, improve their business actions, improve their day-to-day -day business through the use of what we build collectively as a group on top of FTC3 to solve their business problems. Um, and that really is the point of this talk. What, we want, what I wanted to do today um, when I saw that we were going to be back in a room together was inflict myself upon you all for half an hour um, and do so by championing the firms in the industry who are doing great things in, on top of and around FTC3. Uh, so that's what I've spent the last uh, few weeks doing. Um, we see uh, a huge amount of benefit from the standardization that FTC3 bring, brings. Um, there has been work in and around this space for the last 10 to 15 years in financial services and capital markets engineering, I think. Um, but it has often been uh, proprietary and led by a single firm who knew that it was not the answer, that they were never going to get huge upkeep. There was no way that a large tier one sell side, if they'd gone and implemented something like FTC3, was going to get their buy side counterparties or their sell side competitors um, coming together like we are all today without an intermediary like FinOS and the, the creation of the FTC3 standard. So it's important that we don't forget that as well, that there is value in the standard and it stops a lot of awkward conversations from happening um, elsewhere in the organizations that we, that we exist in. Um, it's really great to, to see the fact that FTC3 gets top billing or almost top billing at FinOS um, and this conference over the last couple of, couple of days or yesterday and today. Um, I'm, a sh I'm told that it's going to be just as a focal point uh, at um, OSSF in New York next month. And equally, it uh, sounds like it'll be very, given a lot of focus at Symphony Innovate, either the following or the preceding week. Um, 
I'm not sure which, but uh, it's getting a lot of billing, which is fantastic. Proceeding? Proceeding week. Thank you very much, Lizzie. Um, so, what's the point of this talk? Well, we want to increase the speed of FTC3 uptake and indeed this, the speed of innovation within FTC3. Um, we want to champion the great work and vision of FinOS members who are out there doing work on the ground and maybe expose some of the problems that they're facing uh, that aren't, isn't being brought to the, the program committee and the working groups. Um, we want to show, sh shift focus, as I mentioned, from um, from vendor value, if you'll apologise for me for being so blunt, to user value uh, so that we get uh, more uptake and start seeing some real benefits in a flywheel created of, of user, user force. Um, so what are we going to cover? Um, I've spoken to, over the last couple of weeks, uh, NatWest Markets, State Street and RBC, who were very kind to volunteer their time as well as um, be um, sort of get into the spirit of things at OSSF and talk about their strategy and talk about their roadmap. Um, I've listened to them, written down um, what I think they said to me. Uh, any mistakes that are introduced through the transcription effect are entirely mine. They have entirely plausible den deniability about anything that I they go about saying. Uh, and we're very fortunate here to have Sachin from State Street, who is going to speak on State Street's behalf rather than uh, me doing it for them, which is, which is fantastic as well. Uh, and then very quickly we'll touch on some conclusions as well, um, if you think I'm qualified at all to make any. So. On we go. Let's start with uh, NatWest Markets. Um, so, what is the vision for FTC3 at NatWest Markets? Well, um, very interestingly, they consider uh, the vision to be all about enabling something you can do tomorrow that you can't do today. They gate all funding decisions based on the answer to that question as to, and as to whether the answer to that question is a compelling one for the amount of money they have to invest. So it's a pretty clear case, and those users are salespeople, traders, and their clients. Uh, it's not about us in IT having an ivory tower and having a lot of fun with cool gadgets. Um, what they're trying to do is make it really focused on user value, um, which is fantastic. And they've been pretty focused about the users they're, they're concentrating on as well. And it has to be said that um, FTC3 is a key component of this, of this way of thinking, but it's not the only um, way they're achieving those goals. But I didn't, yeah, I didn't get into any of that. But there is a, there is a wider initiative there as well. Um, so they have a couple of initiatives that uh, came out in the conversations I had with them. The first was around creating context everywhere. Um, so they want to drive key user journeys and workflows for their users, those three groups of people I, I, I mentioned, sales, trading, and pretty critically, external clients. And they want to enable the, the transparent sharing of context between, those app, between their applications, internal applications, uh, to configure workspaces with a given context. So some of the things that came out in conversation with the team were, for example, uh, bringing forward uh, the counterparty based on client interactions. So if you're a salesperson, you are dealing with a call with a client, um, one of your many automated VoIP tele tele telephony systems uh, works like magic to bring that client's details to, to the fore based after picking up the incoming call as an event, um, auto-populating that client context uh, for various purposes like research and trade history. Um, so that is a fairly common desire to try to create a sales cockpit, a sales dashboard, anything that improves the, um, the CRM ability of salespeople in the firm to deal with their clients in a more effective way. Um, people have been doing this for quite some number of years. Um, it's not particularly, uh, it's not necessarily novel in itself, um, but the technology that they're using now is designed to enable that to happen across the bank uh, all at once without a lot of scheduling overhead, which is, which is a big benefit of, of FD, FDC3. Um, interestingly, they're trying to do so in a platform agnostic way. So they're trying to build out agnostic FDC3, an agnostic FDC3 interop implementation. Uh, they're calling it backplane. Um, it was mentioned yesterday at the working group um, that uh, hopefully some of us managed to attend. I caught the second half of it. Uh, they're providing an FDC3 interop bus uh, independent of Cosaic and OpenFin, which are the, the platforms they have internally, uh, and also enabling them to interrupt with existing legacy applications. Uh, interestingly, uh, they still have the use case of making context move between the, a user with two different desktops stuck under their desk. So they still have uh, the problem of large, heavy, monolithic applications that need their own machine to, um, 
uh, run, take that multitasking vision of the future to uh, be able to share context between them and move trade details, order details, et cetera, et cetera, uh, rather than two keyboards and copying and pasting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's interesting that even though we're still, we're, we're now firmly into a hybrid work remote, work from anywhere world, there's still a collection of users that need to be served who have two desktops sitting under their, under their machine. Um, so they want to broadcast context and intents between various desktop containers all on the same user space, which may indeed stretch across two different desktops, which is, which is very interesting. Um, the second initiative that we discussed uh, is around app application discovery. Um, so this is obviously based on intents, the intent part of the FTC3 specification. Um, so that means that applications can register and serve particular intents, doing so in a late bound fashion, um, all done via an open standard, uh, and in the end, across firms as well, which is fantastic. Now, they have a very interesting um, value driver here, which is, which is great, beyond just enabling workflow for the user desktop, um, enabling more things to happen. They also see this as a real opportunity to drive um, total cost of ownership reduction by removing duplicate functionality. Uh, so they think that by getting applications and capabilities into an intent dictionary, an intent, an intent library, uh, they can figure out where equal capabilities are being surfaced and can remove duplicate spend. Um, that obviously requires them to create a centralized store uh, and drive internal participation. But it's really easy, it's very interesting to see that there's um, a sophistication of thought there that if you manage to get things centralized and have a thousand flowers bloom, uh, you can then start reducing cost because you don't have everyone building the same charting or the same CRM infrastructure, which is, which is very interesting. Um, further into the future there, um, they have a goal that uh, every monolithic app is intended to be simplified and broken down into micro front ends and exposing inter-app functionality and capability via FTC3. Um, they are very focused, interestingly, on accessing their clients. Um, so they are not a tier one universal who can afford to build um, a huge uh, SDP. Um, they know that by using non-proprietary tech uh, and a, a semantic standard, FTC3, uh, they can deploy functionality onto their client's desktops with integrations that their client can configure and use themselves. And this would be very difficult with a proprietary standard. They, are see, they see this as a real route to, a real digital channel and a route to market to access their clients, which is, which is really interesting. Um, furthermore, um, they want to uh, enable features that can be used to support both, for example, rates, and then where it can be easily duplicated for FX without a generic loss of uh, without a loss of functionality, or loss of generality, I should say. By, m by making the API for these different components FTC3, they feel that they can relatively easily uh, see the subset of functionality that works in both the rates and the FX world. Um, they want to enable non-product specific or agnostic features that work across clients and asset classes. And they want to enable cross-product workflows, uh, i.e. components that are common to both product types that can be serviced in both areas. And then obviously following on from that, figuring out which one is the best and reducing spend uh, where different asset classes are engaged in exactly the same business functionality delivery. Um, so that's NatWest Markets. I'm gonna hand over to Sachin to speak for State Street, uh, and then I'll come back and finish off with, uh, with RBC. Sachin, over to you. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone, I'm Sachin, uh, a software development leader at Global Link State Street. At GlobalLink, we run a, a bunch of trading and analytics platforms like FX Connect, KernX, and BestX. Um, earlier this year, we kicked off a project to uh, build a GlobalLink uh, a desktop application for our end users, uh, and that's when we came across FTC3. Uh, what we are looking to do is provide a unified and integrated experience to end users. So this is where uh, this project in Global Link is is different from you know a, a lot of the initial implementations uh, based on FTC3, where we're going to the end users outside the organization um, with FTC3 and providing them you know the, the benefits. Now it became um, obvious quite quickly that it was common sense uh, you know to use FTC3 as as foundation for our interop capabilities within the application. So our APIs within the Global Link desktop platform. Uh, or application, I should say, are based on, you know, uh, are inspired by FTC3. Uh, we are using context sharing based on, you know, uh, by broadcasting and, you know, by raising and registering intents. We're doing context sharing based on instrument IDs, uh, order IDs and trade IDs uh, to give trader that, you know, unified experience that they thrive 
uh, for or they they you know they, they look forward to um, we also use registering and raising intent for workflows like free trade analytics um, you know which allows you know which is allowing FX connect and best text to work you know um, uh, very nicely together now um, so other areas where we're using FTC3 is uh, for our command-based interaction, you know, in the global and desktop platform. So that too is built around FTC3. Um, now, where do we think uh, the road ahead leads, right? So as an organization, uh, it's quite apparent uh, that we are invested in FTC3 and we want to do uh, our best to contribute, um, you know, uh, towards the evolution. Uh, we are setting up, uh, or we are leaning towards setting up an inner source project within the organization, and which aligns with uh, FDC3 committee and the Finos implementation. Hoping to be a Finos member if the budget gets approved. Um, and some of the areas we have had some feedback uh, from a lot of partners, uh, you know, buy side firms, and um, a common theme across, you know, them touches upon two primary areas. Uh, first one is uh, their concern around access management, right? So they, they want to have more say in uh, what kind of applications, you know, do they communicate with. Now, uh, container platforms like Winsamble, they have done a great job in coming up with the initial implementation. Uh, but we think uh, it will add a lot of value uh, and it will future-proof the work if this became part of uh, the FDC3 standard. Uh, the next area is um, enriching the context definitions, right? So. Uh, where we see uh, we see a big role for FTC3 in um, in modernizing the the legacy bilateral you know rigid integrations and move towards you know open integrations and this is where we think you know if we had a richer set of context definitions that would you know um, you know take away those um, pitfalls and you know uh, and provide provide us the real be benefit. Now our hope is uh, that uh, as the community grows that will happen naturally. So we're looking quite, uh, you know, uh, we're looking forward to it and uh, be a part of the FDC3 journey. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much, Sachin. Uh, any applause for Sachin? He's not going to come back on stage. There we go. Thank you all very much. So, um, RBC to, to round us out today. So, um, what is the vision for FDC3 at, at RBC? Um, uh, very thoughtful is how I would summarize it. Um, very thoughtful indeed. Um, they are focusing initially on internal cross-application communications, uh, and they are having the if they're using FTC3 to stop internal arguments. That's my paraphrase of what they've said, but it's certainly something we use FTC3 for when we go in and do a, an engagement with clients. So if we can bring in an external standard to say this is how it works, you save on average six to twelve months of a lot of very reasonable uh, technologists all having very reasonable arguments about things that don't actually matter that much. Um, which is a lot of fun, but in terms of delivering business value, it's not really the outcome that people are, are, are paying, certainly us for. Um, so if at RBC, they are using FTC3 to not reinvent the wheel. Um, if they're having apps talking to each other, then they will be mandating, or they are mandating, I should say, that, that the way that those apps talk to each other is an FTC3 compliant payload. Um, they treat each application itself as an external application to drive the right behavior. So if you have to interact, then you have to build a clean interface, a payload, and interop that way via FTC3, as though you were an external app coming into their ecosystem, and as though you are building a public-facing app that wants to, ex that wants to interoperate with the external world. Um, that's a very strong statement to make, um, and it's impressive that they're, they're enforcing that mandate from the top down. Um, they're using it as a forcing, forcing function, I should say, to check that it is the right place to do it on the UI as well. So the right place to do it, the right place to do that interoperability. Uh, so RBC have a history, uh, from the sounds of things, of doing um, sort of UI-driven or UI-exposed interoperability via the back end. Um, for those of us that have been down that road before, they know it's really, really hard work to um, do that first and then maintain it over time as back ends drift. Uh, and they see it as a much better place to do it on the front end. Um, if we, th their view is that by making it an external interface, an external interface that comes in from Finos and the FTC3 group, um, the barrier is high enough but reachable so that you get the right things to happen. Um, it also means that legacy apps can partake and move to the new world in as, in as a seamless as possible way as possible. Uh, and in general, they view the, the, the FTC3 and the, 
the late bound discoverability and um, uh, sort of uh, binding of functionality is a great way to reduce the scheduling burden uh, of having different teams release binary interfaces or indeed back-end binary interfaces uh, at the same time. So it stops teams from being bound to uh, certain cadence, i.e. the lowest common cadence of a group of teams delivering um, quite frequently from global locations. Uh, and they're seeing that by bringing in this rule and forcing uh, FCC3, they are seeing actually far more integration happen uh, where the server side isn't being controlled by the same team. So multi teams de deploying software, so different teams deploying software are now taking the time to interrupt with each other, where before when different teams were deploying back-end software, they weren't bothering, it was just too much hard work, which is fantastic. So they're seeing real business value come out of it. Um, on the workflows and use, use cases, they are, they are taking a slightly different tact than NatWest markets at the moment. They are wholly focused on risk uh, across the back office and the front office. So they have at the moment lots of legacy platforms in and around the risk world, unsurprisingly, doing lots of things, and they'd like to move them onto more strategic technology. Uh, and FTC3 they see as a way to uh, smooth that transition for the end user experience. Um, they want to share risk contract context, and indeed they led a working group yesterday where they were really getting into the detail of some of that functionality, which was fantastic. Uh, they want to share risk contracts, con context, excuse me. Uh, things like what positions are you clicking on, what, what type of risk are you looking at, uh, and they want to crank up the payload detail and use cases here. So they're really going in very deep on this, on this topic. Um, and they want to present a, or build a common intent framework, a common action framework around information. So things like, I've sent a message about a bond, uh, there's a new trade on the blotter. They want to really define context even more richly on the front end, um, which is interesting. Uh, the, I, I hope that, it, yeah, I, I really hope it works. And it's one of the things that's led me to um, a couple of the conclusions that I thought I would, I would draw for discussion with you all um, based on the conversations I've had. Um, I think it's really important that we figure out a way to bring the FTC3 plumbing that is going on in, in the different firms out of the banks and into Finos or into the vendors. Um, Backplane is a really great example of something that's happening within a bank where they're solving a problem that is absolutely common across industry uh, and should probably be promoted up into a different layer of the, the stack, so to speak. Um, I know that if someone mentioned, spoke to you about this yesterday, Rico, which is fantastic, so maybe this is gonna be an idea that gets some traction, but I think it's, it's very important. That's something that I spotted through these conversations. It's not necessarily a useful way to go about happening across areas of opportunity for, for better collaboration. Um, I think maybe we need to think about, or the FTC3 community could think about, um, getting technologists, be they adjacent to FTC3 or working on FTC3, FTC3 itself, into the forum to talk about the adjacent work they are doing to enable the workflows and the user value being created. Uh, it seems like there might be a lot of discussion about FTC3 itself and the vendor space, that, that the vendor ecosystem that implements it, but equally on the other side of the mirror, or the other side of the line, there might be a lot of technologists doing a lot of very similar work that is restricting the acceleration of FTC3 and restricting the uptake. Um, which, and it would be great to be able to figure out a way to um, capture that and promote it in a systematic way. Um, Additionally, it would be good to release the brakes on uh, verb, noun, intent, context, innovation. Um, I think there is a lot of this happening within the firms that um, I've spoken to. And anecdotally, just from talking about this talk over the last day and a half with people here, people have sort of dropped in reference of different firms saying they've got 100 intents, I'd love to be able to share them. Where do I go? Where do I, where do I, you know, where do I promote what I'm doing? So there's a lot more activity that's happening. There's a lot more that's being created than is getting exposed. And Chris, you talked about community types yesterday, feels like now is the time to go back to that and make a real promotion out of it again, because there seems to be a lot of people looking for somewhere to share, um, and maybe they don't necessarily want to be upgraded to, uh, this, is, this is language I'm inventing on the fly, a first class intent that suddenly, that implies some sort of quality of support or guarantee of supporting that capability f in the future in their app. It's still a really innovative space and we need to be prepared for things to um, go wrong and be broken and be rolled back. Um, so maybe there is an idea of having two tiers of, of intent, something that's experimental and something that's in the standard, and then we can drive uptake by things that really get picked up over the time through, through metrics. So one of the ways we could do this that we've seen within an organization, so within the same, same administrative area, um, is by creating uh, transparency into the intents and the context that are being used. Um, you can get user statistics to, that let you then drive um, the promotion of 
different intents into a higher quality of service. So you could start allocating budget to teams to support that intent if they see that it's really getting picked up and used. Um, and indeed, you can depromote it and let teams stop supporting something that isn't getting used. Um, there's a real risk here um, of people becoming the victims of their own success by promoting uh, a very a very popular intent or capability, and then suddenly being asked to serve the entire wider organization's demands for customization and configuration, which can kill a small team's productivity and the way they can move it at pace. Um, funny to be talking about uh, success being the thing you, you, you least want to have happen, but it is a real risk. It's, it's quite similar to um, the, the pattern we've seen over the years of, of trading systems or trading venue, venues being built in a small silos within an investment bank getting real traction in the market and then having the wider organization all pile into them and immediately start failing because they just weren't built with that sort of wide, broad adoption um, in mind. Uh, and it can, be, it can be a very tricky thing to navigate. Um, so one of the things I wanted to, to discuss and ask the group is if, if there's an initiative within FTC3 to collect runtime metrics to drive investment decisions and product backlog, and obviously in a very anonymized fashion, um, but it would be really interesting to see from groups of users if a company has 100 intents categorize those, see what are the most popular, and see if that pattern replicates itself in, in other organizations as well. Um, so that was all I had for everyone today. Any questions or comments on what I'd said? Graham, yeah. good to see you. How are you? Yeah. It just gives a better experience, um, and it lets you do things in a way. Uh, to me, the, the, the client side integration, if done correctly, is opportunistic or l late bound, and therefore opportunistic. I.e., you get a network effect from having a standard lingua franca that lets you connect five different things without knowing each other, and then suddenly having five five times five possible outcomes uh, to to drive user experience. Server side integration, enterprise service bus, control over what can be published, uh, schema upgrades, database tableau upgrades, like why would you want more of that in your life? It's just really slow, right? But, but if I'm a server side guy, definitely what I want to do, that's my job. I'm paid to do that. Sounds great. So, yeah. Session, yeah. Okay, you will give some, of course, to this resistance, uh, for resistance to removing the client side, uh, you know, or uh, interoperable, uh, they want to audit everything that's happening between the app. And I think this is somewhere, this is another area that if you had it, you know, within a FTC standard, which we could utilize to interrupt your thing and create an audit of the messages, you know, or actions, you know, any conscious sharing happening between the app, that would really help. So, um, for us, for us, we will start with you know custom implementations, and again, as part of FTC, that would be that would be a real aim. So I know it's asked the question all the time about client side versus server side. Now, is where I find that I'm, I'm struggling a lot of the technology is quite fast people in Vermont. Can you just data centric integration versus slightly more slow integration? So if I'm thinking about from a user standpoint, I do the thing I want to update my other things. Cool, that's that's great client side. Hey, I need to move and synchronize. 
Yeah. So the, the bit I want to add is the second thing is I think the real problem, and I think we're addressing that as well, open source security, a lot of our clients are very constrained on what they can do publicly. Even sharing their definition of user ID or whatever, they find it very hard to contribute. And so I do say sometimes, do you make sure they can't contribute even though it's things that they probably want to share and they'd like to be able to do? And that to me is the Can't, can't, yeah, yeah. 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 Even though they're trivial things, they're consistent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to, to your point, Graham, about client side or, or service side, one of the, the early drivers I heard for this was the fact that there are certain types of clients who can very easily integrate with your um, application if you get it onto their desktop, um, and that integration is exposed via some sort of interop, i.e., FTC3. Those same clients would find it technically impossible because they're not that sort of firm to integrate with a back-end API. Um, and if you can get stickability into a workflow on a user desktop, from, the, from, a, from like a, a, a product pers perspective, your clients aren't going to move off your product because it's almost invisible to them and it just works the way they work. Um, so that's, if, if you, and like the mobile device is a great example of that with intents and the way you move between applications. It's a bit ropey, but they're doing their best. Um, that's a big differentiator between. But if but if you're just internally focused, then yeah, you're gonna you 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 purely have a political battle that is yeah, more difficult to answer. Any other comments from anyone else? No. All right. Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs>